Good evening, everyone. Um, again, I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum. Um, tonight's topic is the Tuskegee Airmen. It's, we're in for a very interesting presentation, somewhat different from what we've had before. Tonight's speaker is uh, someone that I've worked with on the exhibits in the past, uh, someone I've driven across the country with, in fact, to install an exhibit. Um, his name's Alan Taylor. Alan has just a truly remarkable personal collection of materials from the World War II years, uh, specifically as relates to the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, like many of our speakers, uh, Alan is very generous with his time. He's very giving of these items. He'll share them with museums for displays. Um, he'll bring them out for classroom visits so people can get their hands on a genuine piece of Tuskegee Airmen history. And uh, he's also very just generous with his resources and, and loves to support youth education endeavors. Um, he's involved with the CAF's Redbird Squadron, which is headquartered uh, at the CAF's headquarters in Dallas. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Alan Taylor. Alan, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. It's uh, time for you to take it away this evening. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and where this collection came from? All right, well, thank you, Keegan. I appreciate the um, introduction. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Keegan and I have known each other for um, a little bit of time, and uh, we have driven across the uh, country together. It's pretty fun. Um, Keegan asked um, you, Mike, about my collection and how did it start. Um, I, I would have to almost go back 45 years ago to the actual beginning of my interest in the military. My uh, father was in the Air Force. He enlisted in 1954 and he ended in about 1980. So, and I have to use the word about because uh, he actually um, was in a very unusual type of position in the military and I'll try not to get into too much detail about it. But my father was involved in um, airborne or aerial reconnaissance for the Air Force Security Service. That is a, uh, as they call it today, I guess it's called the Air Force Intelligence Command, or I don't know, they've changed their 25th Air Force. They changed it quite a bit. I don't keep up with that. But my father was a Russian um, linguist, crypto, but he was a um, airborne um, aerial voice intercept guy, and he did crypto uh, work. So he's been in Virginia. Um, they had some um, stuff in Virginia, and he's been quite a bit. But anyway, um, he started in 1954, and when my father was in the Air Force, when I was a young kid, I would always collect his stuff because I thought it was fascinating. I liked it. And then I come to find out that um, he had people come over the house, and they were uh, older uh, gentlemen that were in the Air Force, and I would just ask them questions and found out that they served in World War II, and I'm around 10 years old at this point. And I'm asking questions and my dad's like, quit asking them questions. And and so I would say, well, could you bring something over the next time you show up? And my dad was uh, like, um, okay, I don't think that'll happen. But next thing you know, I'm I'm collecting material in 1975, 76, 77, and it just keeps going and going. So I've been collecting for nearly 45 years. Uh, I'm 55 years old, so you can see how long it's been um, somewhat in my in my blood, um, or maybe not quite 45 years, but somewhere up between 43 and 44, 45. But I've collected some stuff way before the internet and way before the Tuskegee Airmen were popular. So it's it's quite easy to say that you know I get I guess I was able to acquire the stuff before it became uh, such a treasure um, when it comes to how we um, understand the Tuskegee Airmen today. So I was very fortunate to get my start there. But it continued as I was in high school. My mother would drive me around. I, I didn't have my driver's license. I would literally find people um, and go to their homes and talk to them and ask them for material. They would give me things. And some of, sometimes the items were never what I wanted. They were, they were things that I felt were like, oh, what am I going to do with a pair of sunglasses? Well, I didn't know the Ray-Bans were, you know, actually part of the uh, issue um, for pilots. So I saved them. And next thing you know, um, I have uh, original worn 
Ray-Bans and things that don't really make too much sense from Tuskegee Airmen all over the country because sometimes they didn't have anything. So they would give me what they had. And some guys got rid of their uniforms or gave them away through their families or whatever. And some people would just, you know, give me things that they just happened to have that was related uh, to the experience while they were at Tuskegee or while in the 377th or excuse me, the 477th or the, or the 332nd. So it's just quite interesting. So I have a, um, a series of slides tonight that I would like to go through. Um, and I, I, I would like to say that I was part of the military for 31 years. And because of my military and going from location to location, it allowed me to visit more Tuskegee Airmen throughout the country. So, for instance, when I was stationed in Indiana, um, I was with the Army Corps of Engineers, which I'm an engineer officer in the Army and retired. Um, I stumbled on a, uh, a little town called Brazil, Indiana, which was a few miles west of my location in Greencastle. And I remember reading uh, some years prior that there was a guy from Brazil, Indiana. And I'm like, I can't believe this. It's literally right here. So it was Charles B. Hall. Charles B. Hall was originally from Brazil, Indiana. He was, uh, if you can recall Charles B. Hall, he was one of the first members of the 99th Fighter Squadron that literally shot down the very first uh, enemy aircraft uh, in the, uh, I guess it was the uh, North uh, Africa Theater. So he's with the 99th and he became quite a uh, celebrity because he went on the um, tour for the war bonds to help support the war uh, after being, um, you know, selected for that um, position of uh, uh, war bonds. But anyway, Charles B. Hall lived in uh, Brazil, Indiana, and I go by there and I knock on the doors, try to find Charles B. Hall, and of course he had passed away, and, and I believe he had moved to Oklahoma at some point in his life. He had worked, I believe, for the FAA or something. But Nonetheless, I found some of his relatives, and believe it or not, his relatives actually stayed in the same house that he grew up in. So the house was handed down generation to generation. The house was still sitting there. Family members were still there. And I knock on the door, and and I'm talking to the, the family uh, of the Charles uh, Hall family. And next thing you know, I'm actually getting a piece of Charles B. Hall. So I actually have some items of Charles B. Hall, but they're not presented today because they are currently stored in Ohio, where I'm originally from. But hopefully Keegan will invite me back and I'll be able to have a part two and you can see some of the other artifacts that I have stored away in Ohio. So we'll talk tonight about some of the items tonight. And Keegan, if you don't mind, I guess you can advance to the first slide. Will do. Uh, we're on the first slide here, Alan. Okay. All right. Well, the first slide looks very innocent. It is a uh, what I call a first day cover that was um, a, a piece of the inaugural celebration on July of 1941. This particular uh, piece I was able to find from a lady in Ohio, uh, Springfield, Ohio. Uh, believe it or not, I, I was a grass cutter. I, I cut grass in high school. And this lady was an older lady. I was cutting her grass, and I believe she was living alone at that point. And uh, we were talking, and I told her, my brother, is, so my brother in 1979 graduated from high school and went to Tuskegee to study architecture. So when I was cutting grass, I was, I was in high school. My brother had graduated in 79. I came out in 83. So between 79 and 83, I was cutting grass around the city. And I ran into this lady and I told her, you know, hey, you know, I'm excited. My brother's going off to Tuskegee. And she said, hey, I used to work in Tuskegee. I'm like, you did? Wow. What'd you do? She said, well, I'm a retired nurse and I was an RN and I couldn't find a job because they didn't hire very many black women that were RNs in various locations in, in the uh, United States. So in order to find work when she was a young lady, she ended up with the Veterans Administration at Tuskegee. And um, she was a nurse, a registered nurse at Tuskegee. Um, I guess it's the Veterans Hospital there. So believe it or not, she was uh, in the audience during the uh, 
the inaugural celebration, and she was also responsible for giving the cadets physicals, or part of the of the process was to go through the VA station to station, and and to go through uh, the physical. And I it was kind of weird, but I, I thought you know Maxwell Air Force Base was their point of entry, and they kind of conducted a lot of their stuff there. But believe it or not, uh, it didn't happen at Maxwell, which is around so so many miles west of Tuskegee. I think it's like 25, 30 miles west. So they had the cadets go through a medical screening. But anyway, she was she was at the inaugural celebration and was able to get an envelope. And on this envelope, she decided since she was the nurse at one of the stations, you know, I don't know if it was the first, second, or third station along the the way of getting their physicals but she was able to get their signatures on the back of this letter and she gave it to me when I was in high school. And Keegan, if you're on slide two, that would help um, present the, the signatures to our listeners and uh, uh, webinar guests. But if you look on the back of this um, particular um, attachment, you'll see the cadets and they sign their names as cadets. Everyone is listed there, there were the there were, uh, original 14, but you do not see um, B.O. Davis. B.O. Davis at the time was already a commissioned officer. He was a captain, and there, were, there was no need for him to go through the medical screening because he had been on active duty at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, I believe. So he was actually um, exempt from that process, but he was there during the inaugural celebration, of course but he did not sign the back of this envelope. So what you see there is the very first day of the opening of the flying school at Tuskegee in the original signatures with the word cadet, and you'll have the original five that graduated, and you have the others who did not make it through the training. This is a, I have two documents like this. This particular one is one of the extremely, uh, it's an extremely rare piece because it shows the cadets, it shows the the date stamp on the front of the envelope, which is the beginning of the ceremony. It shows the inaugural stamp, keep, let us, um, you know, keep us flying type of thing. So it's a very unique piece, and I've had it for such a long time, um, and I'm very happy to have it, and that's the slide. So next slide, please. All right. So this particular slide is a tunic. Yeah, I, I've been very blessed to run into people through just my normal activity uh, along the way. And this particular tunic was worn by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Um, uh, I have to make, make sure I'm getting it right because I have so many people here. But this was um, Lewis Jackson, and I'm, I kind of escaped his name for a minute. But Dr. Lewis Jackson was a gentleman who lived in Ohio, in Wilberforce, Ohio, um, and he was the director of, a of aviation during the civilian pilot training program at Tuskegee, and after which the civilian pilot training program turned into um, instructor pilots as contractors for the United States uh, Army. And the tunic here is not a military tunic. It's in a different shade. If you compare it to an officer's tunic, it's not the same shade. There, there are no brass U.S. buttons on this tunic. There is no brass buckle on the tunic to denote it as an officer's tunic. And there's no legendary, um, the armband of an officer on this tunic. This is a true civilian pilot training uniform issued at Tuskegee uh, to Dr. Lewis Jackson with his wings with his instructor badge, and on the uh, right side of the jacket, it's very small, but if you blow it up, I guess you can see it, it says flight instructor. So Lewis Jackson was the director. He was also the president of Central State University where I graduated from college from. So I met him, he retired from Central State many years prior to me going to Central State. In fact, I think he retired possibly in 68 or in during the 60s or so, I'm not quite sure, but he still lived in the area. I used to cut his grass, and as we talk, I always try to slip it in. Hey, you know, I'm a collector of this, but.
but believe it or not, I, I, I was a grass cutter as I was in high school. I was cutting his grass. In fact, he had the tallest grass in the community of Wilberforce. He just couldn't maintain it. So I, I, that's how I met him. I had no clue who he was until we started chatting and come to find out it was Dr. Lewis Jackson. And that's his jacket. Um, and I'm very happy to have it. He was so happy to give it to me because he wanted it to be part of my uh, growing collection at the time. So that is Dr. Lewis Jackson. The next slide, Keegan, is a certificate from Charles Debeau. And if you go back to the slide of the signatures, Charles Debeau was a member of the first class at Tuskegee, and he was also part of the first graduating class in March 1942. Uh, and this is his certificate. It's a original certificate. It has the raised seal on it. If you, uh, I have other photographs. I just did a close up of this one. But this one came from, an, from the family, basically, of Charles Debeau. And the jacket, the next slide, Keegan, is a jacket that was inside, uh, folded up, and it's in, if you know, notice, it's pretty wrinkled looking, <laughs> but it's been folded up for so many years inside of the next slide, which is a suitcase. So the suitcase and the jacket and the certificate and various other items that I have in my collection all came together out of that one suitcase. They had been stored in the suitcase for many, many years. I personally did not meet um, Charles Debeau. Um, I met some of his family members. We've kind of, I tried to uh, record a lot of the stuff, uh, but it, it came through a sale. There was a sale, uh, I guess it's called an estate sale, in Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, when I was stationed in Indiana, I was able to buy that. And I, and I paid, you know, almost nothing for it uh, to the standard of less than $100 for an old raggedy suitcase that they didn't even look inside of. Um, I knew exactly what it was, um, and it was purchased, and there it is. So I have a flight jacket of the, one of the first members to graduate Tuskegee Flying Program in 1942. I have a, a suitcase and certificate, photographs, and various other things that were tucked into this uh, suitcase. So I was very pleased to get that. And that suitcase was purchased in, um, let's see, I'm going to say uh, around 1992, uh, I think it was. It must have been in 92. So that's just something that, you know, you never know what you'll find when you're out looking for items uh, that are of interest to you. So that came that direction. Uh, the next slide, Keegan. Uh, the next item is a small uh, pocket Bible that was given to a gentleman by the last name of Custis. And Captain Lamuel Custis was also a member of the first class at Tuskegee in 1941, graduating in March of 1942. He was a classmate of Charles Debeau, and I have uh, that I displayed at the Atlanta exhibit with Keegan and uh, when we did that a few years ago. There's the original um, items of Mr. Custis that I was able to acquire, um, and they are the flight suits, the gloves, and you know the whole nine yards. I was able to get uh, quite a bit of items from uh, Mr. Custis. But this particular book was tucked away in one of the items. And if you open it up, it has an inscription, of course. It's from a family member talking about, you know, please be safe and hurry home and all that. But it's such a personal touch. I personally did not meet Mr. Custis. Um, these earlier people in the Tuskegee program were pretty much gone uh, and out of my, um, my sights by the time I was able to work my way to that direction, because I mainly started in the Ohio area, around the Dayton, Springfield, Columbus, Cincinnati area, and as I graduated college and, and entered into the military and got different assignments around the country, I would expand and reach out to other folks. So by the time I was able to get to uh, Captain Custis, he had already uh, passed away. Um, this next item, Keegan, if you can advance the slide, please. 
the next item is a unauthorized, unofficial 99th Pursuit Squadron patch, original, handmade, made uh, very limited made. I would say there's probably originally less than 10 that were made, handmade originally. They were never made in production. They were never put into production. They were never approved by the Air Force. And they were mainly seen during the days of the Chinook field in Illinois before the mechanics were able to come out of the mechanic training and sent to Tuskegee. So the picture you see next to it is a gentleman, and I believe it's Williams. He's, he's unidentified, but I believe his name is Williams, and I'm not quite 100% sure what his first name is. I've, I've been told Williams, but that jacket that he has on, the patch, is a very early unauthorized silk handmade patch like the one you see in my collection. Uh, that is the only photograph that I've ever seen a Tuskegee Airman uh, wearing that patch. Uh, and of course, that photograph is a reproduction. It's not original. I was able to find that photograph in the archives of the Air Force, and I originally spotted it while working with the Rise Above program uh, on the side of their 50-foot expandable theater is that picture. And I'm walking past the picture one day, and I've seen the expandable trailer at least a uh, hundred times prior, but not really looking at the detail. I look at that picture, and I see that unauthorized patch, and I can't believe it. That is the only known picture of this patch being worn officially. Now, there is another patch like it at the National Park Service uh, location at Tuskegee at the Moulton Field. It's in very bad condition. Uh, it's on a jacket. It's being. It's on display. Um, and that's the only one other than the one that I have that um, that exists. I'm sure there's got to be more out there, but this one that I have was acquired by a gentleman that was able to buy it, and I honestly believe it was from the Custis estate. He wasn't for sure where he got it from, but he listed it on, of all places, eBay. And one a friend of mine called me and says, man, you might want to look at something. I don't know what I'm looking at, but I think you might want to look at it. And I couldn't believe what I saw. And I made the arrangements with the gentleman that owned it and tried to get the history. He didn't have any history behind it. But the patch has been reviewed. It has been, um, you know, uh, authenticated by the uh, collectors and other folks that are involved in the Tuskegee program. And that, in fact, is a true original. And I do believe it came about the same time when the uh, Custis um, estate was uh, floating around. And I believe that's where that came from. It, it came from the Pennsylvania area. So that's a very rare patch. I'm very pleased to have it. The next slide, Keegan. And if I'm going too fast, Keegan, or if there's anything that you want me to elaborate more on, I can slow it down and and we can talk a little bit, but this next... I think your pacing is good, Alan. Um, I think we're all really okay. interested in the items you have, so happy to have you keep sharing. Okay. okay, no problem. So we're now on to the double victory um, slide, and you'll notice that it is a white uh, coverall. Uh, at one point, um, there were several civilian pilot training programs throughout the country that that was set up at historical black colleges, one of them being West Virginia State University, which was the first one, and Tuskegee Hampton Institute in Virginia, uh, and so on and so forth. But this particular item came from Prairie View in Texas. And I drove uh, after meeting a person uh, that said, hey, I think my grandfather was uh, part of something. I'm, we're not sure. You know, there's a bunch of stuff you might want to come look at. So I drive to Wichita Falls, um, which is not, well, it's a little far, far for me, but I was able to get up there, and next thing you know, I'm looking at a double victory <laughs> item that was used in, in the Prairie View version of the Civilian Pilot Training Program. And if you can look at it in detail, it's kind of hard to see it, but it says Prairie View on the top, which 
establishes its Prairie View College. Uh, it's, it's poorly laid out because it says Prairie View at the top and way at the bottom it says college. So it says Prairie View College, National Defense, Victory at Home, and Victory Abroad. And that was a piece of a campaign in 1943 that was trying to explain to the folks that, hey, we're going to have victory at home and we're going to have victory abroad because we're being proven that we are successful in our endeavors supporting the war um, and doing our part. And that's, you know, pertaining to African-Americans doing their part, their, you know, contribution to the to the effort. And this particular item on the front of it, I I should have taken the front of it, but it has 1943 um, embroidered on the front that matches the same embroidery that's on the back. And then it has these flying wings, a symbol, an emblem of a flight, a school, a flight school um, emblem that very closely resembles the Air Corps emblem. But that is a very, very early civilian pilot training program uh, jumper. I'm not sure if it was a mechanic jumper or if it was a uh, the actual pilot uh, jumper that they used while they were around aircraft or, or working in the hangar. But that particular item is a um, very nice piece. I've never seen another one like it. I have asked questions, um, and uh, they don't seem to have photographs of this or anyone um, in their archives at Prairie View. But Prairie View, uh, there is a training film that is released by the Air Force archives that shows Prairie View as a location that was uh, very, um, it, wasn't in existence for very long. I think it lasted for like a year, uh, and then it all consolidated um, elsewhere. The, the program was not very successful. They, they felt that um, the story behind the civilian pilot training program for African Americans was Chief Anderson decided, hey, we're not very successful when we're divided. They had schools at various locations. They were limitedly uh, successful, very limited, and they felt that if they came together in one spot, they would have a chance, a better chance of being successful. And they basically agreed to it, and they all descended uh, down uh, to Tuskegee, where they had good flying weather, and they all felt that that was the best location. So a lot of the schools closed down, and they all, the pilots, the instructors, and some of the faculty all went to Tuskegee. And that's the information of the um, coming from Chief Charles Anderson um, before he passed away. I have had a chance to sit down and speak with him. Uh, the next slide, Keegan, is a uh, photograph of a helmet that I have. It's a flying helmet. It's the early model. There's no electronics in it. Uh, this was given to me uh, by a gentleman, a Tuskegee Airman, uh, and this gentleman. Uh, was his name was C. I. Williams, C. I. Williams, and uh, C. I. Williams is from Dayton, Ohio, and I took this helmet uh, in the 1980s. Uh, that's when I acquired it. It had a few signatures on it at the time, but I took the helmet um, and had it sent to Tuskegee with my brother. My brother was taking flight uh, training from Chief Anderson at the time and he signed it. So on this helmet, it's not necessarily Tuskegee Airmen. They are early black aviators that are on this helmet, one of them being Neil Loving. Neil Loving was a gentleman that lived in Detroit, Michigan. He had lost his legs in a glider accident with the Silver, Silver Air Patrol, and he was a, um, a pilot and an uh, engineer, and he is known as a early... Um, black aviator um, with the coffee school of aeronautics and some other folks that back in the days of Detroit having a flight school. This gentleman was part of it, but he he, he ended up becoming an, uh, a, an engineer, and I think he was a um, either a structural or mechanical engineer, I'm not sure, but he ended up retiring at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and he helped develop the composite material of the SR-71 back 
in the early 60s or mid 60s when that aircraft was being developed he was part of the development of the SR-71, at least the composite material of it. So that's Neil Loving's signature on there. There's another gentleman on there by the name of, uh, of course, Chief Charles Anderson is on there. Walter Palmer is on there. We'll talk a little bit about Walter coming up. Uh, Chuck Nesby, uh, Nesby is on there. John Lanier is on there. We'll talk about John Lanier. And there's a few other uh, folks on there um, uh, that. Uh, was able to sign that helmet. And I'm just, I was so tickled uh, to have that uh, from an original airman with signatures already on it. And then I acquired signatures back in the 80s of the uh, of the ones that my brother uh, or I were able to run into while he was at Tuskegee or while I was up in Ohio. So that, that to me was one of my first, you know, attempts of, you know, trying to be um, a professional about it. <laughs> But it's it's a it turned out it has turned out to be a great piece. It's it's a very beautiful piece. Uh, the next item, Keegan, is a that is a promotion certificate. It's dated 1947, just very very shy of the creation of the Air Force. So if you know about the history of the whole experience from 1940 to about 1949, that's less than 10 years. The uh, civilian pilot training program started in 1940. The first class entered Tuskegee in 1941. They graduated in 42, March of 42. And basically the war ended in 1945. So here we have a certificate of a gentleman by the name of Hugh White. He served, uh, he graduated in class 44. I think it's 44F actually. And he was able to fly in combat. He was shot down and he evaded. In fact, he was listed as missing in action, killed in action. Uh, and then he surfaced because he was shot down and he was evading for at least two weeks or so on the ground. And then it took him some time to make his way back. But this gentleman here was awarded the Purple Heart. Um, and his this particular promotion was just prior to the Air Force being created in September of 1947. So the the document says Air Corps on it. He was a, uh, promoted to first lieutenant in the Air Corps. Had this been two months later, it would have said in the Air Force 1947. That would have been a, a really early piece. But this is the tail end of the transfer of the name of the Air Corps into their own um, in 1947. But in 1948, there was an executive order, I believe it was 9981, President Truman signed, which is to help um, segregate the um, the Air Force. They, they tried to make an attempt in 1948, but it didn't get into desegregation until May of 1949. So this gentleman here was stationed at Lockbourne Air Force Base in 1948, no, 1947. After the war, he was, they didn't know what to do with the Tuskegee Airmen, the 370 or the 332nd. So they formed a composite squadron of all the various squadrons in Ohio at Lockbourne to kind of give them a interim location and also give the Air Force a chance to figure out what they're going to do with these guys. And this particular guy was sent to Columbus, Ohio, Lockbourne, and he was um, a pilot assigned to the composite uh, group up there. And um, this gentleman here um, became a state representative. So even after the war, he uh, went on to become a representative, and he died in, I believe, 1979. I think he died in 79. But anyway, that's a great piece. You can see some of the details. If you go to the, the slide that's next to it, it's just a, a little detail of it. I think it's a, a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful item. Uh, Keegan, the next slide, if you don't mind, is a, uh, that entered into my collection through a gentleman by the name of John Lanier. John Lanier was a pilot in the 301st, 301st Fighter Squadron. He might, also have been in class 44. I think it would be either 44 or 45. Um, and I think it F, 45F or 40, yeah, F. 
Anyway, John Lanier liked to collect antiques. He was an antique guy. He did a lot of um, flea markets. <laughs> and believe it or not, uh, I met him in Springfield, Ohio in about 1984 at a flea market in Springfield. The guy is from Cincinnati, Ohio. He has now passed away. But we were sitting there talking about antiques, and it may not have been about military, but I started talking about military. Hey, if you happen to have anything, he's like, son, do you know who I am? I'm John Lanier. And I'm like, oh, I don't know a John Lanier. I'm sorry. And of course, he told me who he was, and I'm like, oh my goodness, a Tuskegee Airman. And this is in 1984. And we're, we're talking, we're talking, and he wants to, you know, uh, do something for me. I want to listen. I want to receive what he wants to give me. And the flea market was once a month, uh, is a very large flea market in Springfield, Ohio at the fairgrounds. And I kept missing him. I would always have something that I had to do after our initial visit. Uh, when I first met him, uh, I don't know what kept me from getting back to him, but it took around six months. I finally got a chance to get back with him. And he's been carrying around in his car this painting that he wanted to give me. And he was he kept it because he said, I know you're going to be back. I know you're going to be back. I lost your number. And uh, this is before the cell phone. This is before email and before all those things. So it was kind of a challenge to keep in touch. But nonetheless, um, I was able to get this oil painting from John Lanier of B.O. Davis. The history behind this photograph or the painting is B.O. Davis did not like it. This was a commission, a government commission uh, painting of him while he was in command of, I think it might have been, I'm, ooh, I I forgot the, uh, the branch that it was. It could have been the um, it was a command in Washington, D.C., and it was supposed to be um, on the wall somewhere in his office or on the wall somewhere in this office building, and he didn't like it. He wanted another one done. He said it doesn't look right. Uh, his ribbons, if you can look at the, the, the painting closely, you can see that there were uh, his ribbons that he earned, his awards, and I guess he didn't like them. I don't know why. He just he was very much a stickler, and he said no. So that this painting was supposed to be destroyed, and for some reason it was never destroyed. This is this was property of the government. They used to do that for their commanding generals. Uh, they would they would do a painting that they would hang uh, in their office location, um, and uh, there was another one painted, and the other one has the proper um ribbons the colorations right bill davis approved it but this one was marked destroyed and charles lanier i mean excuse me john lanier was able to acquire it i have no idea how but he told me it was supposed to be destroyed he got a hold to it he's had it all of his life and then he handed it to me and i've had it in my collection it's a beautiful it's a beautiful uh painting i don't see what is wrong with the painting other than the uh the awards were were probably not uh, painted properly, but other than that, it's a beautiful painting. So that's original of uh, B.O. Davis. And uh, that uh, next slide, Keegan, if you don't mind, this is um, this is just a a circular or a flyer or a um, a small booklet that has around 50 pages. But during my search of Tuskegee items, um, I was looking for yearbooks, class books at one time, and I kept coming up with the same class book. It's like, isn't there any class book beyond the first class book? And no one knew the answer, but I found out that between the first book that was released and the last book that was released, there were several of these released as generic class books. So these are actually hard to find, <laughs> believe it or not. They are they are a supplemental to the yearbook. They they just didn't have the the funds or they didn't have the interest of making class books. And so they 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 published this particular book to 
so that they can have a keepsake or a souvenir of their time at Tuskegee. And I ended up with several of these. And, and they're all signed by the original owners, which are normally cadets that graduated. Uh, some of them have inscriptions of good luck to so-and-so and, you know, all that type of signatures on it. So this is a very unusual piece. They're, they're, they were produced by a lot of airfields. There's, there's different airfields that produced these at one point. They got away from the uh, class, uh, like a high school yearbook, and they started producing these. And that's one of them from Tuskegee uh, Advanced Flying School, basic and advanced flying school. So the next slide, please, Keegan. This is a Western Union um, announcement to a family, uh, letting the family know that they have a son that was um, killed while flying in uh, combat. It's a uh, Williams is the last name. Um, and I believe it was a uh, Cleveland Williams, I believe it was. And this is out of Virginia also. So if you look at it, I think it's Roanoke, Virginia. I, I can't remember for sure. But there's two flyers. There's two um, Western uh, unions here. One is to the mother and one is to his brother who was serving in the Army uh, when his brother was serving in the Air Corps. So these little tidbits are very nice to get. I have quite a few different ones, uh, different correspondence. I have victory mail. I have other correspondence um, showing their condolence uh, of other various uh, people. And this is just one that I decided to, to showcase. But um, this is just um, one piece of a more of a personal connection to Tuskegee. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay. This is a navigation case. Um, and they, I guess it was um, a briefcase that was used for navigating um, carrying your maps and your E6B and all that stuff. This belonged to a guy that I met in, um, in Kentucky who worked for the Army Corps of Engineers as a surveyor. And we were talking one day, um, and he said, I was in the Tuskegee program. I said, were you a pilot? He said, no, I was not a pilot. And come to find out, he was a navigator and bombardier. And... Um, and he gave me uh, this out of his collection. I, I can't think of his name at the moment, um, but uh, maybe I'll remember it as I go through. But uh, this particular item came to me as a surprise. I came to work one day on my desk, just sitting on my desk with no notes, no nothing, other than it's all yours, uh, written on a handwritten note, um, and it was from him. This is some of the items that he still had uh, that he felt he can give me. And it's a flying cap, the headphones, and all of his uh, maps and equipment, pencils and protractors um, that are inside the, the, the actual case. This gentleman was, um, was involved in a mishap <laughs> uh, on the Ohio River. They were flying a B-25 on the Ohio River and they tried to fly under a bridge on the Ohio River, and they didn't make it, and they crashed, landed into the Ohio River. And at one point, there was a B-25 Mitchell in the Ohio River that was part of the 477th Bomb Group. <laughs> and he was on board when they did that stunt. Um, and, uh, and he talked about it several times. But that's, uh, that's, that is a guy that, uh, that was in one of the mishaps. Uh, the next slide, Keegan, is a flight jacket and May vest of a, a flight uh, jacket and a preserver, water life preserver of um, actual Walter J. Palmer. His uh, middle name is J.A. Palmer, so it's Walter J.A. Palmer. He uh, was a member of the Tuskegee um, program. He was with the 99th, and then he transferred into the 100th squadron. So if you look at the jacket, the jacket has the 100th fighter squadron patch on it. He was originally part of the 99th. He extended his time and went on to fly around 158 combat missions with the uh, 100th, well, a combined of 158 combat missions with the 99th and the 100th. And this, that is his flight jacket. He was um, a gentleman that lived in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, while I was stationed there at the gentleman's uh, st 
stuff that I was able to acquire from him. I used to go by his house and talk to him, and he was um, a very nice guy. He loved to, to talk about it, and he gave me his items and asked me to keep it and, and to be able to show it to others, and that's what I plan to do. So there's a flight jacket. It's a standard A2 flight jacket, nothing special about it other than the patch, and his name and his wings are on it. Um, and it's uh, it's a nice jacket. The um, next slide, Keegan, if you will, is um, two class books, uh, just showing you the variations of the class books. Um, they're very hard to find. They are um, very expensive if you do find them because there's no denying once you open up the book, it's Tuskegee Airmen, of course, it's written on, on the front Tuskegee. So a lot of people like to demand high prices but my particular um, items came directly out of their hands to me, um, and that's what makes things special about my collection is that a lot of my items were handed to me uh, with no charge and only on a promise that I would continue to talk about it, showcase as much as possible, and like uh, earlier mentioned, that's what I do. I'd like to show and talk, especially to people uh, that have the interest in the program itself, uh, but the books are um, are very hard to find, so I don't really let people go through the books as much. Uh, only if it's a um, an ancestor, a family member, descendant of a Tuskegee Airman can they flip through the books because they're fragile, and I don't care to have them uh, torn apart. But anyway, they, they're very hard to find. I have several of these in my collection. These are only two examples uh, of the actual uh, class books. Uh, I think it's very, very beautiful. Um, the next slide, Keegan, if you don't mind, and this is our last slide for the evening. Um, this particular um, is a painting. I have um, a, a four by three, four foot by three foot painting that hung in the headquarters in Lockbourne Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio, during the consolidated uh, time of the composite squadron. This is called the 99th Flying Home. It's it's a, a hand painted item. It's very um, crudely painted. I think it's a beautiful painting, but it, it you can tell that it's you know it's painted not by you know someone Picasso or something, but it's it's like a folk art. But it's very beautiful. It it uh, it hung in the headquarters building uh, for many years before um, you know of course they closed the. Um, the base down, but they also um, uh, deactivated the unit um, in 1949, I believe it was. Uh, yeah, 1948, 49, they were decommissioned. And I don't know where the painting went in between time, but this one also came from the gentleman of Hugh White. And uh, Hugh White was the guy that I mentioned earlier uh, that became a state representative. And uh, the gentleman that died in 1979, this came from his family members that they wanted me to have it, and I was able to acquire it. I went to St. Louis and picked it up, um, and I was, um, you know, very happy to, to get it because it is a, a very early uh, painting. It's dated, um, I think, 1944 or 45 on it, uh, but it's very beautiful. It's a large uh, four by three. Um, and I'm going to hang it in one of my rooms when I get an opportunity. Um, and I think, Keegan, that's about it on the actual slide deck. Uh, and I'm open uh, at this point uh, for any questions, if you might have, and hopefully I'll have some answers for, for the individuals. Well, Alan, thank you so much for that walk through your collection this evening. Uh, there definitely are a lot of questions here. I hope you're ready. Okay. Well, I hope I can answer. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for sliding a few bonus items in there. I think we all appreciated seeing them. Alan, um, with 45 mm -hmm. years of collecting now under your belt, um, you've obviously made the commitment to share these items with people. What's your sort of dream scenario? What would you like to have happen to these items? Uh, well, <laughs> my my children have no interest in, in my uh, hobbies. But uh, thankfully, I am connected to people like um, uh, Keegan and others that have the same interest. And I think eventually I'm going to find a home for it, uh, for the collection. Um, and, uh, you know, 
there's no um, better place for something like this is to be displayed. Uh, of course, I've kept it in my home for many years, but I do get it out and, and display. So I'm not just a guy that to collect it and not keep my promise. But I will probably uh, hand it over to an institution of, at some point. Um, uh, just finding the, the right institution is what I'm um, thinking about. It's certainly not an easy job, and I'm sure that none of us envy uh, the work you're having to do to find the right home for it. Alan, um, mm. it seems like a lot of what you've acquired in your collection came by way of almost small world circumstances. Uh, what advice would you have for future collectors out there uh, in terms of how to kind of tap into that in the post-internet era? <laughs> yeah, um, some of my pieces have come through by way of the internet. It has opened up a lot of opportunity, but there's nothing better than actually um, being uh, in the same room, talking to someone that experienced the experienced the situation. Um, but that you know doesn't happen um, anymore, at least not as frequent as it did uh, back in the '80s when I was really hard at it. Um, my only advice is to, you know, um, you know, stick with your, with your program. If, if that's what you want to do, um, I have driven hours for things that I'm not really happy, like, <laughs> um, a shaver, you know, a, a, a literally a, a, a men's shaver <laughs> that was an old shaver, um, that he had while at Tuskegee. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And, and I'm not knocking the thing. I'm not a. I'm not, you know, looking for, you know, the gold mine or anything. But I, over time, you get you get all kinds of stuff. I have af athletic equipment from Tuskegee uh, Flying School. I have pillowcases and uh, things that, you know, most guys go for the flight jackets and the helmets and the, you know, that kind of stuff. I I never turn down anything. So my advice is be committed, stay focused. Don't upset yourself if it's not what you thought that you were going to get. <laughs> Even though you're sitting there in the same room with the person looking at something, you may not get it. But there have been things that come to me 20 years later after the gentleman has, has passed away because the family members will remember me or remember you for being so diligent and uh, persistent in some cases. But at least they know you and eventually you'll get something in the mail. So just stay focused on, on, your, on your goals. I think that's great advice. Um, we've got another question here. Um, you showed an image of B.O. Davis. Can you tell us a little bit more about who B.O. Davis was? Sure. Uh, B.O. Davis was the son of B.O. Davis Sr. B.O. Davis Sr. was the first black general officer in the Army. Um, he B.O. Davis Jr. was a West Point graduate. Uh, he had originally entered into the cavalry. Uh, there was really very limited places for a West Point graduate, especially a black West Point graduate. So he ended up in the Buffalo Soldiers, as they call it, the 10th Cavalry. Uh, but this is, of course, um, you know, in the 1930s, um, after he graduated, there were no uh, wars going on at the time. Um, but soon after that, um, we were trying to keep ourselves out of war uh, by um, loaning and donating war goods to various countries but by december uh 7th 1941 we had no choice but to enter into the war but that gave opportunity for bo davis to uh, transfer from the cavalry into the um, air corps and at that time there still wasn't any opportunity for him they hadn't even formed up but they were there was a lot of success at the earlier moments of trying to create a flying program they kept him um very interested in staying with the ideal of creating a flying squadron. They would certainly make him their uh, commanding officer or make him the the higher ranking officer at the time. He was the youngest one. He was the first. He was a West Pointer. Uh, so Bill Davis basically is is the first commanding officer of the Tuskegee Airmen experience. He commanded the 99th. He was in the first class in 1942, March. Of 1942. He um, was also the commander of the composite squadron at Lockbourne. He also became the first black base commander. Um, the entire base was under his command in, Cle in 
Columbus, Ohio. So he became the first black commanding officer of a base. He became, you know, a lot of first uh, as far as Air Force goes after the uh, desegregation of May 1949. He became the first of many things. But he was a very good officer, very stern, very polished, very by the book. And he was, I was told that he had very little humor. Um, and you, so you, so you had to straighten up, as they say, and fly right because of him and how he led the entire experience. I think if it wasn't for him, they wouldn't have been so successful. As you know, the 99th Pursuit Squadron originally went over underneath the 33rd Fighter Group in um, the 12th Air Force in the Northwest African Theater. And the commander of the 33rd Fighter Group tried his best to eliminate the use of the 99th. So they, you know, gave them very meaningful flying duty and they couldn't do what they were sent there to do. And the word got back to Washington how horrible these pilots were. And if it wasn't for B.O. Davis and his push and his his willingness to step outside the box a little bit and argue with Washington, that um, the program probably would have been a uh, a wash. But B.O. Davis, uh, it gives credit, we give credit for him saving the 99th and then creating the 332nd, which is the fighter group that then created the 100th fighter squadron, the 301st and the 302nd, all under the 15th Air Force. And he was able to command the 332nd fighter group and it was became very successful. So he is he is one of the grandfathers of the program or the ex total experience. So they, they owe a lot to B.O. Davis and his personality of being strict, being straightforward, being showing no humor <laughs> and talking, um, you know, what's on his mind um, and being very believable. He's a great guy. He also became um, one of the uh, first um, general officers other than um, Chappie James was the other gentleman uh, in the program. There were several others, but but Bill Davis was one of the first, and and he's such appreciated for his his actions. Alan, talking of um, you know key personalities early in the program, um, you mentioned Chief Anderson earlier. He had the mm -hmm. kind of distinct honor of of flying an important flight. Um, you know there was yeah. some political wrangling going on about whether or not. Um, it would be appropriate for African Americans uh, in, in in the segregated United States to actually be entrusted with high performance military equipment. And Chief Anderson contributed to the the overcoming of that. Can you tell us a little bit about that flight? Right. Well, Chief Anderson was also one of those guys with a very unique personality. Um, and I believe I'm not quite sure what the particular date of the flight in question was but i believe it was in 1941 um just prior to the opening of the flight school the actual army air corps uh flight school they had a civilian pilot training program down at tuskegee and eleanor roosevelt was able to take a ride um, an unofficial flight and with that flight she was so uh excited and she had quite a quite positive a lot of things to say about the program she she went back to washington and insisted that the program be expanded that you know the the program is very successful things are going very well and uh if it wasn't for eleanor roosevelt in that unofficial flight i don't think it would have happened so we credit chief charles anderson as the gentleman to uh to take the initiative to offer a flight to the first lady which was just off a cuff you know that's like me asking you know our first lady our current first lady would you like to go flying in our L2 just right off the cuff? And she, she agrees and says, sure. I'm like, wow. And then, you know, so, so that is um, one of the uh, saving early saving grace of the uh, blacks in aviation was the fact that chief Anderson uh, took the liberty of asking her, inviting her into the, uh, the space, which is come down to Tuskegee, see what we're doing. And then, surprisingly asking her to take a flight with him, with him in a Piper Cub. So when you look at the original photograph of the Piper Cub picture, 
most Piper Cub pilots will notice a couple of things that are weird straight off. First of all, what's what's weird is that um, Chief Anderson is actually sitting in the front seat. That is pretty strange for a guy his size. I'm I'm around uh, 5'11", and I can't hardly sit in the front seat of a Piper Cub. <laughs> so Chief Anderson is literally sitting in the front seat. Eleanor Roosevelt was a very tall woman from what I understand, so she was in the back seat. Chief Anderson was able to fly that thing from the front. So that's that's the first thing I can't believe. And, and of, of course, the center of gravity, the CG of that thing, um, it's just amazing. Underneath the, the photograph, or excuse me, underneath the wing of the in the original photograph is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Lewis uh, Jackson, again, the director of the uh, flying program. So I had the liberty of meeting both of those guys. I, I knew I cut the grass for Lewis Jackson and I knew Charles, um, you know, Chief Charles Anderson, you know, not as a, you know, confidant friend, but I was able to meet him at least once. And and so I, I just feel like, you know, there's a connection there. I think that's a, a connection for me. But if it wasn't for Chief Anderson um, asked, boldly asking her to go fly, I don't think the program would have been so successful. And then the creation of the air, the flying school for the Army Air Corps in that same vicinity. So that's the flight that you're referring to, and I think that that's one of our um, our earliest known successful flights of the uh, First Lady. Definitely an interesting story, and uh, folks out there, if you haven't seen the picture, definitely look it up. Um, it's a kind of a very interesting story behind the image. Uh, evidently, mm -hmm. Eleanor Roosevelt didn't consult with the Secret Service before doing this, uh, making them all very uncomfortable and very nervous. Um, Alan, you mentioned yeah. the 99th Pursuit Squadron. Uh, later on, you know, the th 332nd Fighter Group emerges once there mm -hmm. are enough pilots and personnel to round out the group. Um, but there was also the uh, the, the 477th, the, the bomber unit. They never right. made it operationally into combat because they fought for the double victory in a slightly different way. Alan, can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the Freeman Field mutiny that would ultimately impact their combat readiness? Right, yeah, the, the Freeman uh, Field mutiny happened in Columbus, Indiana. Um, that That is such an interesting story. Um, from what my information is from, from that is they were all denied access into the officers club after being permanent assigned to Freeman Field, which gives all officers the uh, opportunity to, uh, you know, go to the officers club. <laughs> you, you're, you're an officer assigned. You're, you're allowed to uh, use the officers club there on the base. Well, at the time, there was only one officers club, and the white officers that, were, that was there did not want the black officers in the officers club. So they were all pretty much um, arrested for entering the officer's club. And the original group was arrested and detained. And then all of them decided, you know what, if those guys are going to get detained, then we're all going to get detained. And so the entire um, staff of the 477th basically was detained for X amount of time. Uh, and by being detained and going through the formal court martials and going through the process and all that, they were delayed their um, operational ready for the Mediterranean, Meta not Mediterranean, for the South Pacific region. Uh, the 477, they had no pilots. They were all detained. So, you know, they, they didn't have enough pilots to go uh, operational because of the fact they were all being detained or they were being held under some type of policy because of their negative activity and they had to go through um, all of that. So basically, as soon as that happened, they were removed from Freeman Field and sent back to Goodman Field, which is in Kentucky, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And back and forth, they, they, they went. One base didn't want them, the other base didn't want them, the other base, they just go back and forth between Freeman Field and Goodman Field, uh, and so they ended up just per pretty much permanently staying in Kentucky throughout that process of the 477th. Unfortunately, they never gained the operational readiness to go into combat, uh, only because they were extremely behind schedule, 
on getting uh, all of their um, tickets punched uh, to go into the theater because of the Freeman Field incident. So a lot of people, you know, are are like, well, I don't understand. Why did they all get uh, detained and arrested? Well, the base commander was adamant about processing them for court martial, and so um, Godman Field um, became their sanctuary. Uh, only because of the fact that um, the base commander at Friedman Field didn't want him, and he was going to prosecute and um, issue Article 15s to every one of them, and it just um, it just got to be a very nasty mess. Um, so that's that's what I know of that program. But the 477th was a was also pretty much a composite uh, deal. They, these were formed. The the group was formed mainly from elements of the earlier days of the 99th Fighter Squadron and the other squadrons that were rotating back from theater after they did their requirements of, of being in country, they came back and they some formed into the 477th Bomb Group, which was also basically a composite group. But they, they retrained, classified as multi-engine and also navigators and bombardiers and, and gunners and flight engineers and things of that nature but there's a um there there were flight training in texas that uh that um actually trained the navigation and the bombardiers and things like that and i have that stuff here also as well in my collection that i would love to share uh as we you know if we invite it again i have the 477 stuff so it's 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 just a very interesting piece of history that delayed their their operational readiness because of the uh, the Freeman Field mutiny, where almost nearly the entire unit was arrested. Um, and I think had they not been arrested, they might have had a chance to fly over there. Uh, there there's also known stories that no black uh, pilots flew combat in the South Pacific. Well, that's not true. There was the um, artillery groups, the infantry divisions, the 93rd, I believe it was. It's either the 92nd or 93rd, I, I forget. Um, they were in the South Pacific, and they had liaison pilots. And the black liaison pilots were trained at Tuskegee. Uh, some of them were trained in um, in Oklahoma at Fort Seal. But of some of the earlier ones were trained at Tuskegee, um, and they flew combat in the South Pacific as liaison pilots. They were artillery spotters. So uh, if that's a myth, it's it, to me it's been it's been um, proven that black pilots flew in both the European theater of operation and also the uh, South Pacific theater of operation, the Pacific theater of operation. Yeah, Alan, I think I remember uh, reading some stuff about that the last time we were all together mm -hmm. researching these things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's the, As you mentioned, the 477th was going to be flying B-25s, and the 332nd would become famous flying Mustangs, though there were a range of other airplanes um, operated mm -hmm. by the 99th earlier on. Uh, can you tell us where the red tails came from? Okay, um, when the um, 332nd actually formed up, which was after the when they did, got away from the 33rd Fighter Group, um, I was told by um, the gentleman Walter Palmer that the 15th Air Force required um, that the planes would identify themselves because it was a means of identifying them during their escort bombing uh, days when they were escorting bombers, which started in June of uh, 1944 and their escort duties ended in May of 1945. But it became a uh, a squadron uh, identification, uh, quickly identifying uh, a squadron. You know, you got to realize tube radios back then. They had the old radios, and maybe the radios were not as good, uh, or the channels were hard to find the frequency or something. But you can easily identify what airplane it was by the color of the tail. So they decided to paint theirs red, and it stuck. And they decided, you know, that's a nice color. So. Every one of their squadrons had red tails, but they had various striping identifi identifiers that identified them as either the 99, the 100, the 301st, or the 302nd, just based on the, the numbering on the, on the side of the aircraft and the checkering within the uh, trim tabs or the leading edge, in some cases, or the cowling 
had a checkered board that was either the 301st or the 302nd or the 100th or the 99th, but they all basically had red painted tails. The earlier 99th squadron did not have red tails. From what I was told, they did not have it. They, they had hand-me-down airplanes, and whatever they came uh, during that time, uh, they were all green P-40s, and they kept them all green P-40s. They didn't repaint them. Um, but as they acquired um, various um, battle-worn airplanes from other squadrons that were getting newer airplanes, the 99th would just keep them just kind of beat up as they were and just kind of flew, flew around and did their missions with the 33rd fighter group, which wasn't very much, just kind of, um, you know, um, just flying around in areas that had no German um, um, occupation or very limited occupation. Uh, so they didn't they didn't have a purpose of identifying themselves as much. But once they got into the 15th Air Force in uh, June of uh, 1944, there was a slew of fighter units that were doing escort duties. And, and the fast and easiest way to identify them was to paint the tails red and also the the, the wings and the um, the uh, some of the other parts of the aircraft would paint it red to denote the uh, 99th, or excuse me, the 332nd fighter group. Alan, while it's certainly not true that the Tuskegee Airmen never lost a bomber, and it may be more accurate to say they never left one behind, um, and it will be debated uh, much on beyond our own lifespans as to whether or not, uh, you know, there was ever an ace produced by the program. Um, can you talk a little bit about how their service record during the war uh, contributed to the ultimate desegregation of the Air Force? Yeah, that, that's been a, uh, a debate for many years um, about their record. Um, and I know it's been controversial um, uh, for many of them to even argue this fact, but I believe uh, due to engine failure, due to mechanical failures, due to other um, flak um, being shot up in the air, there were bombers that were lost while the Tuskegee Airmen were in the vicinity of escorting those bombers. So how do you connect that loss to that squadron, the, the 332nd? I, it's hard to say. But uh, I think the success, the overall success of the 332nd Fighter Group was based on the fact that they were very uh, disciplined flyers and they were not out to hot rod or, the, or to showcase or to uh, act independently while they were flying escort duty. Um, I've been told and I've read in other, um, you know, accounts that other squadrons lacked the discipline. They would just peel off and start chasing and uh, doing their thing. And, you know, they didn't have much of a, of a discipline. Um, they were more out to get their kills. Uh, instead of sticking with the formation, they would outdo, the, they would just do their thing. But, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's just an argument that's going to live on beyond me. But I believe that the success of their missions was mainly because of the fact that B.O. Davis had created such a disciplined environment. His officers that replaced B.O. Davis as he rotated back, which was um, um, Spanky Roberts uh, became the commander and other commanders, they all maintained that same discipline that was, in, that was instilled in them from the B.O. Davis commanding uh, days, the earlier days. Uh, and I think their record was, um, Exemplary. Uh, they had a, around 60 Purple Hearts issued, um, and that shows that they were there being, you know, um, you know, had issues. They were either shot down, they were either killed, they were injured, um, you know, by flak, machine gun fire, whatever it may be. There were there were Purple Hearts issued. There were Distinguished Flying Crosses issued. There were Air Medals issued. There were kills that were issued that were um, that were registered and recorded as actual kills. There were even um, myths about who shot down the first ME-262 German jet. Uh, it goes to the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, you know, uh, so there's just a lot of things that just was kind of all over the place. But I think it was their overall discipline and, and the way they flew their missions that made them successful, that brought them into the desegregation of the Air Force and, and keeping those guys around because they, they did, once they did break away from the 33rd uh, Fighter Group and was into the 
three thirty second fighter group, that's when they became uh flourished. That's when things started happening and they started noticing the numbers uh better than what uh had been recorded with the thirty third fighter group, which was a deliberate sabotage, I believe. Well, certainly B.O. Davis believed it um, because he campaigned uh, to have them assigned to more hazardous and dangerous duties um, because he believed they were being sent to fly over empty expanses of the desert to deliberately um, yeah. sandbag their combat record. Um, Alan, yeah. did you have to be in a civilian pilot training program situation before joining the Tuskegee Airmen, or was that just a, a function of the early classes having kind of been processed through the training program um, that existed before the Tuskegee program did? Yeah, well, there. from what my understanding is, is there was a lot of applicants that were denied opportunities to be uh, military pilots at the in the earlier days. Of course, you had to have the aptitude and, and the mental capability but uh, the civilian pilot training program was created to initially create more uh, surplus of pilots for the United States before they entered into the war in uh, December of 1941. So the civilian pilot training program expands from 1939 to about 1944 or 45 um, when they were in existence. But no, you did not have to be in the civilian pilot training program in order to be uh, accepted into a military flight program, but it did help. Of course, it 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 built confidence in a lot of people to to go on to more advanced uh, uh, aircraft. Um, you know, the the civilian pilot training program. I think the the largest they might have had was the Stearman at the time, but um, but it's it's still an unforgiving airplane because of the center gravity of that uh, of the fuel tank on a Stearman being high above uh, forward. So once you can master the steerman, you know, the next step was to go from, you know, basic into advanced flying. So a lot of these civilian pilot um, graduates had already accomplished the steerman. So it really gave them a head start. Um, and you, I think you can honestly tell the difference between a civilian pilot training person and one that was right off the street. But there were a lot of successes, uh, regardless if they had it or not. Uh, think, um, um, uh, Spanky Roberts um, was a um, graduate of the civilian pilot training program at uh, West Virginia State, uh, and he was also one of the first graduates of the first class in 1942, March of 42, at Tuskegee. So there were success stories that said, well, the program works because we have a graduate, the first one, and the first five to graduate. And then you have to argue and say, well, there's other, the four, the other ones didn't have it, uh, civilian pilot training program. So it's a mixed bag of how they felt that the civilian pilot training program, was it successful or not? I believe it was. I believe they created nearly 100,000 surplus pilots of various um, ethnic, well, not ethnic groups, but they did allow women and they did allow blacks and they did allow uh, Europeans or white uh, people to do it. Um, and I think it was a successful program, um, and uh, and it also helped with uh, establishing the the cadre of uh, Tuskegee to get those guys up and uh, going. <clears throat> Alan, um, we know that Allied bomber crews would request escort from these red-tailed fighters, and that was a, a point of pride with at least some of the airmen who emblazoned their airplanes uh, with the, the, the phrase by request. Um, what was mm -hmm. the, the German opinion of what was going on? It's often been said that uh, the Germans nicknamed them the Schwarze Volkmenschen, the Black Birdmen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Have you mm -hmm. ever heard anything about the, the sort of German perspective on the Tuskegee Airmen? Um, you know, I think the Germans were, were very respectful towards the aviators, may they be black or white aviators. Um, there's not much negativity that I know of from the German perspective. I know once they were uh, captured or brought into the prison of war camps, they were treated the same. They did have uh, hate uh, exhibited from the others on the ground that were their own uh, American crews that were um, uh, detained. 
and the Germans kind of treated them all the same. So it's it's kind of a hard to to, to explain. Um, you know, the Germans didn't have a um, have an interest or a, or a stigma when it comes to you know the black uh, relationships of America at the time. Of course, you know we know we've had slavery and we had civil rights and and um, you know Jim Crow and all this stuff. And uh, there's a lot of things going on between the um, the the American soldiers versus you know how they treated each other during wartime. But they were requested. But that's about it. Yeah, they were requested because they were such disciplined pilots. But when it came to mingling or on the ground, they were they were not integrated. Um, uh, they had their own separate air base at Remtelli, uh, which was several miles away from the uh, neighboring uh, fighter units. Um, and so they were pretty much isolated or segregated uh, there in Italy. Uh, but there were no, uh, you know, uh, come together times that I know of. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen or read anything about various, um, you know, come together uh, uh, events during the campaign in uh, in Italy. But um, I know the Germans did have some level of respect. But other than that, um, you know, they were they were shot down just like any other pilots if the, the Germans can get to them. Alan, I think we've got just a few more questions to round out the evening. Thank you again for, for all of your time answering these questions. Um, we know that, uh, you know, the, the, the Tuskegee Airmen of today, those that survive, they include both pilots and maintenance personnel. Uh, the pilots extend the maintenance personnel, the recognition as Tuskegee Airmen. Um, but are there any you keep in touch with regularly? Uh, Obviously, Charles McGee, mm -hmm. uh, one of the 332nd's mm -hmm. pilots, um, is yes. still around, and you know he's recently been a uh, participant in several VE Day commemorations and so on. Are there any airmen that you you stay connected with? Uh, yes, yes, and no. Um, you know, I I'm not actively involved as I was um, some years ago. I do participate in in uh, related events, and of course. Um, you know, uh, I'll see them there, but there's a few here in the Dallas area uh, that I that I see. There's a few of them in uh, Ohio, uh, not very many. Uh, and if you know, there's there's relatives that I keep in contact with um, that are relatives or children of Tuskegee Airmen that I uh, know uh, through my relationships. So it's 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 um, unfortunately I don't know the the number. But uh, in, uh, at one point, there were over 10,000 participants collectively in the uh, Tuskegee program. And that includes the ground crews, the, uh, the surveyors, the doctors, the dentists, you know, the, the, the people who played roles uh, in the military uh, on the bases um, of where these people were stationed at. Um, and right now, I believe there may be less than 300. I don't know the true number. I hate to give a number and, and I'm either high or too low, but there's not very many. Uh, they would now be well in their 80s, past uh, um, early 90s, if not well into their uh, 90s at this point. So um, you can see, you know, the numbers dwindling down. And it's it's people like me and people like you and others that it's very important to continue to support museums and to uh, to create programs and to show and showcase items and to talk and make presentations and to keep the history alive as much as possible. So, um, you know, uh, keeping in contact with people is kind of tough at the, at the moment because of the numbers being uh, dwindling down and their health is not uh, very well to travel or, or you know, they, they, they just, you know, uh, fragile at this point. So it's, it's tough, but I do keep in touch. Um, with some and uh, and uh, some uh, are more descendants or family members of Tuskegee Airmen that I that I keep in touch with, and uh, but I'm not a member of any of the groups though. Uh, I'm not members of of the Tuskegee Airmen's Association or any um, other groups other than the um, the one group that I associate with here in Dallas. So it. Um, you know, it's it's pretty tough, Keegan, these days to uh, to go out and, and knock on the door and, and actually talk to one. Um, my days of that were fun, 
I remember me begging my mother to drive me around. I, I didn't have a driver's license before I was 16, so she would drive me to Cincinnati, drive me to Columbus. I would go to Dayton. I would, you know, get someone to take me somewhere. And then as I got my license, I started reaching out and going a little further. And uh, next thing you know, I'm I'm knocking on doors and and uh, the, the next state over. So um, you know, those days were were fun, but they they won't be uh, any longer. It's certainly a reality that we face every day that there are fewer and fewer members of that generation still around uh, mm-hmm. and able to share their stories. Mm-hmm. And, and thank you, Alan, mm-hmm. for your credit to the, the museums around the country uh, that try to keep mm-hmm. some semblance of that story alive. Um, just two mm-hmm. more questions here for you, Alan. Um, a lot of airmen in between the end of World War II and when you started talking to folks here stateside, um, those that were career, eventually Air Force men, um, in a lot of instances, took overseas um, assignments as a way to take them out of the the conflicted, segregated environment that was still surrounding many of the bases here in the United States. Um, have you ever had the opportunity to to talk to any of those airmen who were overseas for extended periods after the war? Yeah, uh, I have. Um, that's that's a very good question. Um, there were a lot of them assigned um, in Europe, uh, Germany, France, um, and even uh, North Africa regions. We had air bases at one point um, in a lot of locations. And they did take command and they did take uh, positions abroad because they just wanted to get away from the current uh, environment of the United States during the 50s and the 1960s. Um, I don't have any personal stories uh, about you know the 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 attitudes towards them from the French or from the German people in the 1950s or 60s, but I do know that um, they did um, want to get away uh, as far away as possible from from the United States to to continue their service. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know other people don't look at um, a, a race as a negativity uh, like the French. They pretty much accepted uh, the, the, the guys um, and the Germans um, after World War II. The Germans were very, um, you know, open towards, um, you know, black service members. I served in Germany. Uh, my father served in Germany. He also served in North Africa. He was in uh, Liberia. Um, my father um, joined in uh, 1954, and, um, and he, um, of course, uh, felt some uh, levels of segregation and things of that nature throughout his career. But being in his uh, unique career, um, he was able to, you know, somewhat overcome that because of his uniqueness that he had, his training, being a Russian crypto linguist. You know, if you get mad at him, then there's probably no replacement for several days or months. So you're going to have to make do with what you got. So he was able to um, um, you know, integrate himself into several units. But I do know that uh, the Tuskegee guys that wanted to stay in, stayed in, and a lot of them became lieutenant colonels. They did 20 years. Uh, some of them became full colonels um, and, and uh, Air Force Reserve duties and also National Guard duties and regular Air Force. So uh, Charles Debeau, uh as an example, stayed in the Air Force as a reservist in uh, Indianapolis, and he stayed until 1965, I believe, or somewhere in the mid 60s, and he made the rank of lieutenant colonel. And there's several of of uh, stories like that that they stayed around. He was not in a flying position uh, at that point, but he still uh, was a flying um, uh, officer. You know, he had his wings, uh, but uh, and probably no one even knew who he was unless he told them. But the fact of the matter that he stayed around until the uh, 1960s. And then you have people like Chappie James who stayed around until the 70s, and he became a commanding officer, the first four-star general um, in the United States, the Air Force first black uh, four-star general in the United States. So those are the things that are so special. Um, uh, when when uh, those guys stayed around and continue to uh, act as role models and lead the way in into uh, desegregation and you know the integration of, of the guys. Um, and it also became role models for my father and role models for me, um, you know, and, and, and generations hopefully after me. Um, and it just continues on. It just continues. So um, 
I think, um, you know, the posture uh, of the guys wanting to go overseas was a natural thing for them because of the fact that they were treated so much better than what they were in the United States. It's certainly an interesting thing to reflect on the meaning of patriotism when your love mm -hmm. of country inspires you to serve, um, even in spite of its flaws. A few people, I think, are confronted um, with with the flaws of the nation quite the way the Tuskegee Airmen and their later career Air Force um, uh -huh. folks were. Alan, um, our final question for this evening is a, perhaps a personal one for you. Um, as an African-American serviceman yourself, um, can you talk to us a little bit about what it means to you to, to, to have these role models to, to look at and to reference for perseverance, dedication, courage, that kind of knowing love of country? Uh, talk to us a little bit about what that's meant for you in your life. Okay, well, I, I've not thought about it in detail so much, but it's all natural for me. I um, I have pictures of me probably um, I'm going to say five or six years old, seven, and I'm in a um, military uniform. And uh, so I've always wanted to be in the military because I always looked up to my father being in the military and his father being in the military. And I've recently found out that I have family who has served in the Revolutionary War and every war of America since then. So I am from a generation, I'm, I'm from a family that has many generations of uh, patriotism and service to our country. So um, what it means to me is, you know, I feel it being my duty. It was something that I, I felt was important to me. It's not, it's not necessarily important to everybody, and I accept that, and I understand that. But for those who do uh, decide to serve, it is, um, it's very rewarding. I, I've had a 31-year career um, as an enlisted man and as an officer. I served 10 years as an enlisted man, and I went to OCS, Officer Candidate School, when I was 30 years old, and I was commissioned uh, in the Army Corps of Engineers as an engineer. So I've gone from basically, um, you know, as they say, digging ditches, uh, serving as an uh, enlisted man, serving as a non-commissioned officer. My highest rank was an E6. I was a staff sergeant, and I was selected for the OCS. But um, the thing is, is that, you know, it's some, it's just a part of me. I feel that it's so, so important. Um, my children don't have an interest in serving, but, you know, they serve in other ways. Um, they, they take, um, you know, great pride in telling me when, when it's a military related holiday that, um, you know, happy, you know, Veterans Day or something. And, you know, it's, it's great, but, you know, um, it's not for everybody, but it's been fun for me. And uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, I, although I was not an aviator in, in the military, I was an engineer, I still use those guys as my role models because they were still trailblazing. They were still doing things that most others couldn't do. And they were still men. And I felt that it was, and I was, I was talking to them as I was growing up. Uh, being from Ohio and not very far from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, there were a lot of military officers. Uh, that uh, my father uh, knew from his career that I knew because of him. Um, and so I was able to talk to quite a few people uh, growing up. Uh, and that's both black and white. Um, uh, I just was never just a one-sided type of guy. My my godfather was a uh, World War II B-17 pilot, and uh, he was a white guy. His name is Colonel John Morris. And he is from Springfield, Ohio. He's passed away, but he flew um, in the uh, out of England with the 388th Bomb Group, which is the H on the back of the B-17 in a square box, the black square box box with the H, the white H. That was his unit, the 388th Bomb Group, um, and uh, they flew the silver uh, non-painted um, B-17s. And he flew well up into uh, the Vietnam War as a rescue helicopter pilot. He flew the uh, CH-3 and the CH-53, as the, it's called the Jolly Green Giant. He was their commander in, um, in um, Nan Phong Penang, Thailand, where my father was stationed at, NKP Thailand. And they both, being from Springfield, became uh, acquainted with each other because they're both 
from Springfield, Ohio. I guess they bumped into each other at the club or something and come to find out through their uh, talking, they're both from the same place. And I became a family friend of uh, Colonel Morris for many, many years growing up with him. Uh, so it's not just necessarily the Tuskegee experience. It's just the military and what these guys have gone through that I was able to latch on to and use as my role models. Hopefully someone can latch on to me and my story and and continue um, in military um, history, um, you know, for generations to come. But, you know, the Tuskegee Airmen went through a lot. They 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 literally went through a lot. Uh, there was a lot of disrespect. There were a lot of good times and a lot of bad times. Uh, but, you know, it's bittersweet. But I'm here with the collection. It cannot talk, but I would like to talk for it. And so that's, that's what I, I plan to do. Um, it's been quite some time since I've ever been in a discussion with the material. But the, the whole fact of the matter is, is that it's here and I'm, and I'm willing to, um, you know, do something, uh, to share the collection, um, and, and to do the best I can by sharing the collection. Well, thank you, Alan. That dedication to sharing that story, I think, is an inspiration to all of us. So you can't hear applause, but I'm sure there would be some uh, where we physically hear at the museum, uh, you know, presenting the same presentation. Um, hopefully you'll take us up on an invitation to come out and visit at some point once this public health crisis has passed us by. So thank you all again for joining us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you later in the week. Alan, thank you so much. Thank you, Keegan. I appreciate it. And thanks for uh, everyone listening in. Appreciate it. Thank you.